And hello and welcome to Arts and Entertainment. I'm Deborah Gilbert, your host, and so glad that you could be here today with me. I'm so glad that you could take time out to be with me and my guests. I hope you enjoy the show. We're gonna highlight the Downtown Cabaret Theater, which is based in Bridgeport, Connecticut, and Hugh Hallinan, the executive director and producer, is my guest today. And Hugh, thanks so much for being here. Such a pleasure. My, my pleasure, I'm glad, glad to be on your show. Um, people may not know the Downtown Cabaret Theater even exists, let alone we'll head to Bridgeport because we're over here on the shoreline of the state of Connecticut. Tell us about the theater. Right. And, well, first off, why don't we talk about you? Tell us about your background and then we'll talk about the theater. Sure thing. Uh, theater is something that I was virtually born into. Um, I was born and raised in, in Ireland. I was on the theater scene there. My father owned a theater in Dublin called the Olympia Theater. And I used to travel to the theater daily with him uh, when he went to work before I was of school age and l started to learn my craft uh, at the 1500 seat theater on Dame Street in Dublin. And did you think that you were going to stay in the theater world as a young child growing up? I mean, you're still in it and you're a young man still today. What, what kept you in the theater? Uh, you know, it's a good question. I had a couple of off ramps during my career. I, <clears throat> though I've been with the Downtown Cavalry Theater since 1980, um, I was 18 years old when I walked through the door and started running, you know, spotlight and sound and uh, worked my way up. But I also um, latched on to lighting design. And as a uh, national lighting designer, I've done a lot of tours around the United States and um, Europe. Uh, I tinkered with the idea of going into that full time, but I, I really couldn't get comfortable with the idea of always moving around. I like to have a home base. So here I am 42 years later and I'm, I'm still at the Downtown Cavalry here in Bridgeport, even though I made a few detours along the way. Tell us about Dublin, Ireland. What made you and your family leave Ireland, let alone the theater there? I mean, what brought you to America? Um, well, at the time, it took a little persuasion. You know, at, at 18, my sister was three years younger than I was. Um, we didn't want to leave. And um, my parents pulled the old, oh, well, you know, we're just going to try it out. And if we don't like it, we'll, we'll come back home. And um, so I fell for that hook, line, and sinker. Um, but the story goes, my father, uh, during the bicentennial, uh, was an agent to Siobhan McKenna, Peter O'Toole, the chieftains. A lot of the top acts that were in Ireland <clears throat> were under his agency, and they wanted to do a bicentennial show at, um, in New York. And uh, the people that were putting it together contacted my father. One person in particular, they got along well. Um, that was uh, Claude McNeil, who was running the Downtown Cabaret Theatre at the time. He said, you know what, I've got a job for you. You need to come here and, and run this theatre with me. And uh, that's, that's where it all started in 1976. Was your father involved in theatre since he was a young man? It sounds as if it was a part of your family's history for a very long time. It, it was Deborah, um, but he wasn't. He was brought up on a farm in England. He joined the military as you were required to do, the English army, um, not during wartime. Um, and then he met my mother, married, they moved to Ireland, and um, he was looking for a job and he asked around what what does Dublin need? And they were like, they, Dublin needs a good agent for actors. And that's where he started as a, an agent. And then it built from there. So he started from the ground up. I got, I inherited it. <laughs> um, 
when now in the information that you sent me, which you and I discussed before we went on camera, your bio and your overview, your your father was involved with the downtown cabaret theater as you were getting involved in it. Tell us about his experience with the theater. Sure. When we got when we got to the States in 1980, <clears throat> the theater was had actually gone dark. Uh, it, it turned out not to be the best uh, decision. Um, you know, some of the promises that were made uh, didn't didn't work out. So we were we were faced as a family with um, the decision to kind of pack our bags and tuck our tail between our legs and go back to Ireland or make it work. And the decision obviously was to make it work. And we restarted the theater with the first production of Joseph and the Amazing Technicolor Dreamcoat in North America. This was a show that was tried and true at home in Ireland and in England. Um, and it proved to be exactly what it uh, took to get the theater restarted after it had gone dark for about a year. And that's where, as a family, my mother, my father, myself, we just kind of got in there and covered about 10 of the jobs that, um, between the three of us. And we just gained momentum from there to the point where we got to in, I don't know, 96, 97, we did a huge million dollar renovation. But we started as yeah, a community theater, we built up through a union and equity theater and were recognized throughout the state as some of the best um, best theater ranking up there with Goodspeed Opera House and Hartford Stage and some of the other large venues. The Downtown Cabaret Theater sounds as if it has a history located in Bridgeport, Connecticut. Tell us what are some of the things that you folks highlight there. It sounds as if you do many things. We have, uh, rather we do, um, I like to try and, uh, I don't want to reinvent the wheel, but you have to stay relevant. So you need to always kind of approach when you're in the entertainment field, approach it from um, what, what do people want? And if you get something right, make sure you remember what it was so that you can be consistent in delivering that. Uh, so we, we've always been a music entertainment venue. Um, we found that the more kind of, uh, straight plays didn't really pull the people in as much. So one of the unique uh, features of the theater is it is cabaret style where the seating is concerned. So you sit at a table and the other unique part is you bring your own food and you bring your own booze. Um, so half the experience is, is right at the table and the other half is the show that we put on. But to your question, uh, one of the things we realized that audiences only, they were really only um, interested in coming out on the weekends. And we're like, you know, we've only had 300 seats. How do we really kind of make this a viable venture? So we introduced children's theater. That is to say, these are professional actors performing for children with shows like Jack and the Beanstalk, Cinderella, Snow White, and things like that. And so on any given weekend, we would do um, let's just say we were doing um, Ain't Misbehaving as our uh, main stage show musical for adults and grown ups, and we were doing Snow White for the children. On any given weekend, we would do a show at 7 30 on a Friday of Ain't Misbehaving. Then we'd switch the set around for the morning show at noon of Snow White, and they would and then do another Snow White at 2 30. And then at four o'clock, we would turn the whole set and show back around to Ain't Misbehaving and do another performance of that at five o'clock and eight o'clock. And then on Sunday, we'd bang out another two Snow Whites and at five o'clock, another Ain't Misbehaving. So in, in those three days, we would get, we would put on eight different performances. So it was, it's quite a marathon, but we mastered the art of getting it all in there on a Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Now, you're mentioning Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. Do you have other performances that happen Monday through Thursday? So the thing is, Deborah, I would love to find the magic 
um, solution to getting audiences to come out on those days. And we've tried it, you know, we tried to add on a Thursday and it was, it was the attendance was okay, but it wasn't worth, um, it wasn't financially worth trying to put it on. Um, so the fact remains we're a weekend venue and I would love to crack the code on how to make it a seven day a week venue, but um, I'm open to anybody who can enlighten me on that one. <laughs> Um, probably people are curious as to your responsibilities. What do you do there as executive director? <laughs> I take care of all the garbage, and I'm not even kidding. <laughs> After eight performances a weekend, we have so much trash, and then it doesn't get picked up. And I just laugh to myself. I'm thinking of all the jobs that I have to take care of, the one that takes up the most of my time and has the least to do with the show that's on stage is is begging the people that are supposed to be picking up the garbage to come and pick it up um but kidding aside uh you know that does it's it's more of a thorn in my side as a producer you know it's you get it starts off like this we sit down we decide what shows we're going to do in the season then we apply for the permission to see if we can get the rights to do those shows. Once that's done, we organize our creative team. So we hire the directors, the designers, choreographers, and then we get into the casting process where we put the auditions out, we audition for the actors, and then we're into rehearsal. And then we open the show. And normally moments after that, we're back into the process again. I mean, we do 287 performances a year. I don't know really any other theater that cranks out that many shows. And we do it all between Friday and Sunday, 52 weeks a year. And so once that cycle gets going, it's, uh, it's quite a machine. Um, tell us what the viewer will find when they visit the website, which I found was very vibrant. Um, well, that website is going to be updated here. We started it a year ago, uh, just before COVID hit, rather, two years ago. But the website is uh, divided into three parts. There's a, uh, a section that will uh, take you to all the shows that we're doing for children. It's Theatre for Young Audiences, TYA is the, is the acronym. Um, and climbing out of COVID, we're starting off a little slower than we normally do. We're not delivering the 287 performances at the moment, um, but we'll be starting off with uh, a, an abbreviated season with four shows instead of five, and we're adding a haunted house. So that's one part of what they'll find on the website. The next part is the main stage. Uh, those are the Broadway style musicals. We'll be opening Rent the musical on uh, September the 16th. We just finished casting. Um, we're in the process of casting right now. Um, and we have two other productions uh, through the spring, including uh, an original show that we have put together called Decades in Concert, and it'll be the 80s. It's a review show, loads of multimedia, and then after that, the musical Cabaret. And then the third part are tribute concerts, Neil Diamond tribute, Rolling Stones tribute. We sort of fill in on nights that we have open with those kinds of concerts. Those I don't produce. I just have a list of acts that go around and they do a great job. They come in, they do a sound check, they bang out two concerts, everybody has a great time. So those are the three, the three different offerings on our website and of course, that's where you'll be able to buy tickets online. Okay, let's hold that thought. I'm Deborah Gilbert. You are tuned in Arts and Entertainment. We're going to take a break. We'll be right back. Hey, world, I have a quick message. It's about safe driving. All right, let's go. Anytime you're driving, have the seatbelt buckle tight, both hands on the wheel and your phone out of sight. When not in your hand trying to text somebody back, because if you do, your car might get smacked. The moral of the story, just put your phone down. The people on the road will stay safe and sound. Put your phone down, put your phone down. People on the road will stay safe and sound. Yeah. <laughs> Community TV. 
your neighborhood TV. Publicly funded and a reliable partner for cable companies nationwide. It provides transparent coverage of local and state government, education, and public programming. A digital town green that can be watched anywhere, anytime, and on any device. Watch us on today's high-tech distribution methods. Community TV in Connecticut. Local. Unfiltered. Reliable. And, and yours. yours. And welcome back to Arts and Entertainment. I'm Deborah Gilbert, your host, and I hope that you're enjoying the show. Well, we're highlighting the Downtown Cabaret Theater, which is based in Bridgeport, Connecticut, and Hugh Hallinan con continues, excuse me, to be my guest. And Hugh, for the performer or for an individual in the industry that would like to present themselves to you, how do they, uh, I saw on the website the auditions for Rent, uh, how does somebody get to be able to present themselves to you for potential hire? So the process, Deborah, is um, uh, on a couple of channels we put out when we have auditions. Um, so we'll, we'll post that to our social network. Uh, we'll also post it to the website. But in addition, the trade uh, publications that are either uh, digital or print um, like Playbill Online or Backstage. Um, these are places that actors who've been around for a while know to go to in order to see where the auditions are being held. And those, um, those generally get the word out pretty well. Um, I, I always feel based on the turnout of auditions that we could do a better job. Uh, so we, we continue to try and figure out other places to make sure that people know when we are uh, s scheduling auditions for actors. And, and in addition to them, uh, there's the creative team too. You know, it's uh, we have a couple of go-to directors and choreographers, but we like to switch it up. And we would like to make sure that people know to submit their resume or just contact me directly, even if there isn't a job. You know, I invite them down. We have a walk around, a, a talk. They get a feel for if they like the venue, and I get to know that person a little bit better and explain to them how we create the magic. The pandemic you mentioned, how did that affect the theater? Are things getting better there? The, the effect was like something I've never experienced in my 40 odd years of, of being in the business. And I wasn't the only, I wasn't alone. Um, I mean, it was devastating and it was devastating to a lot of other people. I think restaurants and, and entertainment business uh, in particular took the brunt of it. But um, we, while it was very uncertain for a while, I mean, I told my wife, I said, we're selling our house. I said, I don't think we're gonna have I'm going to have an income for the next year and a half, and um, we can't take any chances. We're going to have to downsize immediately, which we did, and 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 I was right. I mean, if people saying, "Oh, maybe three months, maybe six months," I'm like, "No, no, this just take a look at what's happening here." So the good news was there was the the CARES Act. We did get paycheck protection. We did get the shuttered venues. Richard Blumenthal, Senator Richard Blumenthal was very instrumental in making sure that that bill passed. And that gave us the funds to not only survive, but the hardest part of the pandemic is reopening. It's like starting a new business from scratch. All your momentum is gone. And we are in the throes of trying to get that momentum back up and running. And it's proving to be very, very difficult. You're mentioning momentum. What are some of the things that you're doing to get the word out that you're back and performing? I mean, is it is it ads? Is it um, social media? What are some of the things that you're doing? And not enough. I wish I could think of more things. It's it's hard. This it's which comes first, the chicken or the egg? I've got this. There's four of us working at the theater right now. Back to that almost when we walked in the door in 1980, wearing the hats of about 10 or 12 people. And it's it's very difficult to know exactly when to try and plug another person into the mix because there's 
because of the financial strain on the business right now, but we are doing it and we're putting the word out both by direct mail, social media, um, programs like yours, you know, to just make sure that um, the people that we can reach know we're here and know that we need them to, to book tickets, come and take on a great show. That's what they can do to help us get through this restarting process. And I think what's interesting is that people can bring their own food and beverage and see a wonderful production at your facility. I don't think that people would think when they hear downtown cabaret theater that you can do your own food and beverage and enjoy your evening. Is that something new? No, that is a tried and true recipe that that we inherited at the beginning. A lot of a lot of people have said to me over the years, hey, how come you don't get a liquor license and sell booze? You know, you'll make so much money. And it's true, you could, but it takes away from really what the essence of the downtown cabaret theater is, A, B, I'm more, the two businesses that really you need your head examined if you get into it, one is show business, the other is restaurants, and I don't, I don't want to tackle both at the same time. So um, let, let the magic continue. If it, if it works, don't fix it. People love the BYOB part of the downtown cabaret theater. Your thoughts about how you choose your productions? I mean, are there submissions of plays to you that you think about? Are there plays that you would like to do? Um, what does 2023 look like for you? Have you even thought ahead of your calendar? We're, we're getting there. Um, you know, I always, those are the thoughts I have when I wake up at four in the morning and I can't sleep. But the, the choice of the shows is somewhat limited to the fact that I have to pick shows that I believe are going to sell tickets because of the fact we only have 300 seats. We really need to sell at least 225 of those seats to break even. Um, I would love to take chances on new works, but without a much bigger pool of subsidy uh, to cover the revenues um, that likely wouldn't come in. When you do a show that doesn't have a known title, your attendance can drop so dramatically that it, it's not possible to take that chance. So I I look around at what other theaters are doing. I, I look at the, um, there are numbers available that let you know which shows are being done the most and how they're doing uh, overall in terms of attendance. And I use that uh, as a way to try and figure it out. I have my favorite shows and there's a short list of shows that I've never done because I don't believe we would be able to survive it financially. Being that you are a cabaret theater, or at least your title says that, are you part of an association? Is there a national entity that you're a part of? Uh, are you just a special entity in the state of Connecticut? Are, are you unique? I don't think that people realize that you exist and how special you are. Yeah, I, I always, you know, I get up on stage and we, we have a little fundraiser called Lucky Bucks where everybody takes out a bill they want to donate and they, they take a picture of the serial number or they write it down. We throw it in a bucket, we stir it up, we pull one out and and we read back the serial number and if whoever has it wins a gift certificate for like 50 bucks. But I always let the audience know at that point that we want to be the worst kept secret, not the best kept secret. And so, um, no, there's no association. The name Downtown Cabaret um, really is misleading. We are just straight up musical theater um, with the cabaret twist. Um, I don't believe there's an organization there, I'll take that back, Deborah. There are organizations that kind of really specialize in cabaret, but when you're talking cabaret, um, strictly speaking, you know, that's a cabaret, uh, a piano on stage. An actor will come out and just sing a song. You know, sometimes there isn't even any rehearsal. They're just, um, just a, an evening of very light entertainment. It's almost like musical improv, if you will. 
We are starting to run out of time. Any closing thoughts for the viewers? What does the future look like for theater, for your wonderful theater? You have any thoughts? It's it's coming back. It's going to take a while. Uh, you know, venture out to Bridgeport. It's it's easy to reach the theater off of Route 8 and I-95. You know, our subscriptions offer a huge discount, 25%. We're selling them right now. And um, my forecast is we're going to get back to where we were pre-pandemic, but it's going to take another year. Well, I want to thank you so much for being here today. I know that my audience has really loved learning about you, and I think you'll get some new people coming to see you. Okay, that sounds good. Thank you so much. Have a super day, Hugh, and thanks so much for being with us today. I appreciate it. It's my pleasure. Take care. And you've been tuned in to Arts and Entertainment. I'm Deborah Gilbert, your host. In case you think you might be a great guest or you'd like to uh, volunteer for the show, please be in touch with me. I'm at artsandentertainment at mail.com. Hope you have a super day. Thanks so much for tuning in. Hope you enjoyed the show. I'll see you next time.